Hi, I'm Seth Mosley from Full Circle Music, and man, am I excited. This is episode 100 of our Full Circle Music Show podcast, and not only that, the day that we're making a massive announcement. And what is that announcement? It's that we are rebranding. Yes, we're changing the format, the title, everything of our podcast to make it even more packed with value for free for you guys. And the new title, drum roll please, is the Made It in Music podcast by Full Circle Music. It's resources for music makers just like you who wanna go full time in music and stay in. So I just wanted to do something a little special on this episode uh, to, to, to go along with the announcement of the Made It in Music podcast episode 100. And what we're doing this week is we're bringing you a best of episode. We picked our very favorite moments from the Full Circle Music Show and broke down just some really key points, things that we think um, you would get a lot out of, things that we personally got a lot out of. I'm Seth Mosley. Thank you so much for listening. Here with Stacy Wilbur, VP of Publishing and A&R here at Full Circle Music. Man, I love that you picked the Ginny Owens episode because it was one of my favorite, not only podcast episodes, but what a lot of people who are maybe going to go back and listen to this clip don't realize is that it was recorded at one of our Full Circle Academy songwriter mm -hmm. retreats. And man, just if I haven't told you already, I mean, the, the people that you have relationships with that you've been able to uh, bring in to pour into our students is just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. So Thanks. Jenny was one of those. She was at our last one, and I feel like I probably got more feedback um, on her than a lot of speakers that come in. So um, yeah. that's where that's where this podcast was recorded at. So what what stood out to you about that? Like, what made you pick that as your favorite moment? Well, it was my favorite moment because obviously, because we were we were there, we were actually in the moment. It was an experience. Mm -hmm. um, it was Jenny talking about very simple things, three key elements of songwriting. Yeah. But what I loved about it is that she weaved her own story mm. into all three of those elements. Yeah. And <clears throat> I just, I loved, I loved hearing her story yeah. wrapped up into all of that. Yeah. And she talked about it being something that I had not heard. And I think you said the same thing that it, she compares songwriting to being a journey with a friend. A journey with a friend. I, I, you know, that was like an aha moment, I think, for so many, because I don't think everybody looks at it that way. It's a job, it's this, but as a friend. And, yeah. and the closer you get to a friend, you get to know each other. You get to know their hearts. You get to know their stories. And the same yeah. thing with, the song, with songwriting. The more you spend time um, uh, writing every day, yeah. getting to know your craft, understanding um, the different elements of, of songwriting, the better you become and the better you know yeah. yourself as a songwriter. Yeah. And she talks about how it is a sought after treasure too. I thought that mm -hmm. was such a cool mm -hmm. way to put it. What, what did, what did she mean by that? Well, it was interesting because she said it was a sought after treasure um, pursued by an enemy, mm. which, and the enemy, as she describes, are distractions. Mm. Um, the distractions in your life that, that keep you from doing the thing that you love yeah. doing. Yeah. So what are, what are those things and how do you keep those distractions from keeping you from doing what God's plan and purpose is for your life, which is, which is songwriting. Yeah. And I think, man, she just, there, there's there's podcast episodes that we've done that I feel like I just kind of wish I had like a notepad the whole time because mm -hmm. she just kind of drops quote after quote after quote. And one thing that you shared with me that I totally agree with is that uh, good is the enemy of great and perfection is the enemy of creativity. That was mm -hmm. I thought that was brilliant when she said that. Yeah, and I think especially in this industry, we hear a lot of, oh, that's a good song. And that's a good song. Yeah. And that's a good song. And we tend to... Um, leave it there and we don't encourage each other to to strive for the great because mm. it's I think striving for the great is harder yeah because it takes going back and rewriting it takes time and effort the good is ah this is good you know but right. the great I think is is you digging in a little deeper and she really shares that in the podcast she shares 
the struggles that she went through as an artist mm. and um, just in her life personally to get to that point. So yeah, so good. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you picked it because it's one of my favorite moments too. So awesome. here's a clip from Ginny Owens on the Full Circle Music Show live from the Full Circle Academy Songwriters Retreat. I want to offer, just based on my experience as a songwriter over the past billion years, I want to offer three key elements of a life of endless songwriting bliss. So three key elements to maintaining a songwriting life. So the first one is songwriting is a journey with a friend. Show up every day so that you can go a little further together. Songwriting is an art form. The more you know the rules and master the skill, the freer you will be to let your heart guide the process. And songwriting is a sought-after treasure guarded by an enemy. In order to capture it, you must fight every day of your life. Listening, like two different types of listening that I call active and passive listening. So I really love pop music. So active listening for me is like when I work out in the mornings, just roll in the Apple new Apple, like whatever pop playlist or what they're playing at Apple list or at Spotify, you know, playlist and learning, like, you know, what are they doing in the songs that you're hearing that you like? How are they creating hooks? You know, what are the rhythm things sound like that they're doing? And so, you know, things like chain smokers came along and they sort of like created this chorus where you don't have to soar, you know, up in the top, you just do this like, baby, hold me closer in the back seat. I probably shouldn't be singing that at the Christian. Uh, so, but you know, like, it's just this tiny little space of a chorus. So there's just, there are trends that you start to see as you listen to music. If you're like a songwriter-ish type person, you know, like more of a, a James Taylor type person, then you can listen to current people like that do that, like James Bay or John Mayer. Hear what they're doing, sort of study their technique. But the other thing is passive listening. And what I guess I mean by that is falling in love with music. So one of the things I've recently discovered about myself is that I'm too busy like thinking about just analyzing songs and I actually need to go fall in love with music again because it's just too easy to be critical. And so what I've learned is probably the easiest way to do this, which is not something that streaming really lends itself towards, but to go get people's albums and just listen to the full album and continue to immerse myself in it and be patient. Cause I'm sure you, maybe some of you guys are like this too. I'm so impatient. I'll listen to half a song and then I flip to the next song. That does not like create and inspire love for music. I think those things are key for deepening our skill sets, growing our skill sets, educating ourselves. And then there's another aspect, just as we talk about kind of this skill of songwriting. That's really simple, but I think it's really important, especially for new writers. And I kind of call it the accessibility scale. So on one end, you have the more cerebral, the more personal kind of songs. Those are the songs you write for your grandma or your brother or a wedding. And then on the other end are the more super commercial songs. So like Bonnie Bear is super cerebral. Taylor, super commercial. Andrew Peterson, pretty cerebral. Tomlin, Jordan Felice, super commercial. And so the more cerebral a song is, the more it's kind of written to please the writer. So most of those things fall kind of more in the middle. You know, they're not generally purely one or the other. But the more cerebral form matters less, you know, it's kind of in the writer's head. And obviously the more commercial a song is, the more singable it is, the more melodic, the more many people can kind of follow what you're doing. You got to know the difference. If you want to write commercial, study it, learn the techniques, listen to the Full Circle podcast every week because there's an art to expressing yourself that way. But if you're going to write about family, if you're going to write something super personal, don't let that out for critique because you don't want to hurt yourself in that way. You know what I mean? Like you just protect the things that are really personal to you. And the more you kind of know the skill and the art of songwriting, the more you're going to know how to do that. Skill, taking the journey ultimately helps with our biggest challenge as songwriters, which is fighting for your songwriting. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, I bet you do. Everybody probably believes that it's a fight. Songwriting is a treasure that's guarded by an enemy. And so in order to capture it, you must fight every day of your life. 
not to be all dark and wage warish, but we got to wage some more. The hardest part of songwriting is what? Songwriting. <laughs> you know, you always got something else to do. Or there's always a voice in your head that says not to do it. And I promise, lest you think it only happens to new writers, I have this happen every day. I've just finally learned, oh, this is part of it. Like, this is what I'm going to fight every day. And especially when you've been doing it a long time, you can kind of even get more in your head because you're like, what if I don't know how to do anything current? So if you give up, you, you know, then the enemy will win. So what exactly is the enemy? I do like how Kevin Pressfield, who wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, but he has a book called The War of Art, which I would highly recommend you all read. There is some swearing, but read it anyway. But he calls the enemy resistance. And he says, any act that entails commitment of the heart is a reason for resistance. In other words, any act that re rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity, or any act that derives from our higher nature instead of our lower will elicit resistance. Resistance cannot be seen, touched, heard, or smelled, but it can be felt. And the more important, get this, the more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. Ouch. And resistance takes all different forms. Sometimes it's you, right? It's the lack of discipline. That's what it is for me a lot. I just want to do all the other fun things. And I want to think about songwriting. Really, I do. But maybe I'll get to it. That's why scheduling is so key. And there are voices in your head. And that's why scheduling and showing up every day is so key. It diminishes the voices, I promise you. Sometimes it's because you got to eat. And so you got to work. You know, so that's also why finding that time every week and putting it on a calendar can be so awesome to do. Another key in fighting resistance is knowing the people who are in your space, knowing the people who are awesome and can hold you accountable, like probably some folks you've met here, and learning the people who are not safe for you to play music for. Another way to protect what you're writing and who the safe people are not when you're fighting resistance. Now, for those of us who are believers, who are people of faith, we know there is a deeper resistance from an enemy that is full on against you. And especially when it comes to pursuing a gift that God has given you to inspire others. Ex O'Connor. I love it. We're here in the <laughs> studio on uh, this exciting day, episode 100. 100. Recapping some of our favorite moments yep. from the Full Circle Music Show. And Tyler Bryant. Tyler Bryant. Good man. choice. Man, my favorite, dude. We sat down with him. I remember it was like kind of last minute. I got a call early in the morning like, hey, I think we're going to do some Tyler Bryan interview today. So I remember driving down and I was super pumped. I'd loosely known him from being in bands around Nashville. And I was like, I love, you know, I love this dude's music. I'm excited to talk to this guy. And to sit down with him. And I mean, he's a young, he's a young kid, you know, and he's just got his head on just in a way that very few other artists, songwriters, any musical person does. He just realizes that hard work comes above all else everything in life and yeah. this guy his band is successful but not necessarily at radio but you know no real radio number ones no nothing like that but he plays hundred thousand seat venues mm. and it's like that, that blows my mind and to just hear him speak about hard work no one's going to work harder for you than you're going to work for yourself so take every opportunity that you've got and yeah. just just make something out of it yeah i love it and i think he even shared in the episode something about a because they do a lot in europe yeah and i think a fan they were playing somewhere in spain and a fan had like took in a night train yeah like across <laughs> across the continent the literally continent yeah. to like get there yeah. and they were so pumped about it and you you can just tell that when an artist is engaged yeah and they care like the fans can tell that you really care yeah as the artist they're gonna care yeah absolutely and that, that was something that he also spoke about a lot in this interview is relationship building. Like, yeah. not just not just with the people around you, but with the fans. Like, the fans can feel that level of commitment that you have to them. And then, but then on the business side, too, you know, they've, they've been around labels and all that stuff a lot. And yeah. I just love the mentality of be honest with the people you're with. Like, if even if it's a hard conversation to have with somebody, 
the honesty is going to preserve that relationship in the mm -hmm. future. I think he talked about them leaving their label for, you know, for, to kind of go out on their own. And the conversation he had with the label after the fact is like, hey, look, you guys are still always on the list at a, at, you know, at a shakedown show. Mm -hmm. Come out anytime. We, you guys worked hard for us. Just it's time for us to go do something else, and I, I love that mentality. Yeah, and we went and saw him in Nashville at uh, twelve was it twelfth? Uh, third and Lindsley. Third and Lindsley, yeah. which is a really cool venue. Yeah, um, and it was one of the best live shows I think I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, they they go for it, and yeah. it's it's so tight, but it's just raw rock and roll, and yeah. it was a fun night. I hadn't been to a show like that no, in a while. No, no click, tracks. no click. It's just guys on stage, just going for it rock and roll and i i loved it man it was so much fun to just sit there and just be like yep these guys own it this yeah. is great inspiring inspiring for sure well here's a clip from the full circle music show episode with tyler bryant of tyler bryant and the shakedown we've talked about it a little bit but i come from a blues background yep. you know i learned to play from an old blues man in texas and you know even as a kid i was offered a record deal and it was like we're gonna set you up with other kids and we're gonna you know, start a band, and I was like, no, man, I just want to play the blues. You know, I want to make, like, I remember, like, Lyric Street Records gave me a little $10,000 check to go make some recordings. I think they were legitimately upset when I handed them back, like, three Freddie King covers that I had made. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, what did you expect, man? <laughs> um, so, and, and I still kind of have that mentality where, I don't know if you guys ever have dove into this on your show i'm sure you have because it's something that i feel like a lot of our artists struggle with it's mixing art yeah. something that really moves you in commerce yeah let's eat and let's survive and so all we try to do in our band is have a little bit of both yeah you know yeah so touring has been your bread and butter and i mean let's just talk about that i mean how do you get invited out on a acdc or guns and roses tour without radio, without big number one chart-topping songs? It's hard to say, honestly. I think, one, you got to believe in what you're doing. You have to be convicted every time you put on a guitar, whether it's in a writing room, whether it's in a coffee shop. Yep. That's what, you know, I have kids ask me at our shows who have bands, like, how do you get on these tours? How do you get these shows going? And it's like... You literally play every show you get offered. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, whenever I was starting out, I had a fake email account. <laughs> and I was the band's manager. <laughs> My name was like Sarah or something yeah. like this. And I represented <laughs> Tyler. This was before the shakedown. I represented Tyler Bryant. And What's the with, spinal tap manager? Yeah. Oh. yeah and, and it would, <laughs> the cricket bat. you know, and there was, there was another time where it's like I literally called the box office of the House of Blues. This is when I was younger. I called them every single day until they finally told one of the booking agents, this guy won't stop calling. He wants to play. And he called me and was like, dude, like, you can't call the box office and book a show. And I was like, but can you book me? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, send me some recordings. So I sent him some recordings and some videos, and he put my band on for Dickie Betts. And then I called the Dallas Morning News, and I was like, my band is playing, opening up for Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers. I think you should come film it and do a story. Mm. And they did. And it's that kind of hustle that I think is, you know, what I've learned that we have to do. Because yeah, it's yeah. anytime we've waited on someone else to do something for us, we fall short. And so it's, I think those, it's funny because we were at CAA, the booking agency, for a long time. And they did great things for us. And after a, about a year and a half of not touring as much as we'd like. We thought, let's make a change. Let's move agencies. But we had such a good relationship with our agent that he'd become family. This guy named John Huey. Yeah. And so we left. We were on the road supporting Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Mm, yeah. And I get a call from Huey going, he's just like, I love you guys. And I wanted to know if it'd be okay if I pitched you for the ACDC World Tour. Mm. And... Of course, we said yes, but this yeah. is someone who's not our agent. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, maintaining relationships and always shooting people straight. And even if it's a tough conversation going, like, I think we have to move somewhere else because we're not getting the love here. You know, you yep. guys, they kill it with country acts out of Nashville. And I'm sure that the rock department does great, too. We just weren't getting the love that we needed yeah. um, because maybe what we we're doing didn't move them there. But... You know, I think even when a relationship has to 
stop. It doesn't professionally. It doesn't have to stop emotionally. And I think that's an you know we're all from the South and believe in Southern hospitality and shooting people straight even when it's a tough conversation. And I think that's helped benefit our band. Mm. You know. Well, I, I love that because there's so many bands that we come across that are just constantly complaining about their team. They're like, my label's not doing this. My manager's not doing this. We don't have our publisher getting songs on sync. Our publicist is not scheduling. It's just no. excuses and complaining about people not doing stuff for them. And what I'm hearing you say is like, screw that. Do it yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I mean, it's like we just made our own record. And yeah. I called a few of the people from Universal Republic after we got out of our deal. And it was sort of an, I think both parties were like, this isn't really working for us. We weren't giving them what they need to do what they do best. And they were like, you guys just aren't setting yourself up to win, you yeah. know? But I talked to a few people from the label who were like, wait, you guys aren't with us anymore? And it's like, hey, listen, you're always on the guest list at a shakedown show. You yeah. guys come out. Yeah. Thanks for putting in the work, man, because it's hard to find people to work for you. And it's hard to find people who will work as hard as you will, so you have yeah. to do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. Or at least, you know, I mean, even, like, with when it comes to, like, making music videos or mm. setting up photo shoots or finding the direction, I feel like that has to come from the artist because yeah. it, I feel like a lot of artists fall short when they're waiting on someone else to show them the direction. Here at Full Circle Music Studios with Jericho Scroggins. Hey, Thanks hey. for being on the show today, buddy. Oh, thank you for having me. I love the clip that you picked it was uh michael w smith interview it was honestly one of my favorite ones to do so why don't you talk just a little bit about what stood out to you from that and why people should go back and listen to it yeah the the initial part of it is how he's talking about like the start of his career and even how like that's when he got married with debbie it was like in 81 and like, so when the Amy Grant thing and all that kind of stuff, it was a very busy time for his career. And so they saw a bunch of marriages around that time falling apart. And so he does think it's like it's hard for people to tour 200, 250 shows a year and keep a healthy marriage. And so it's super cool to hear how he, um, one thing I didn't know about Michael and his career was he was never more, or he was never away from his family more than two weeks. Hmm. And yeah. it was just like mind blowing to me, like thinking about that, just knowing his career and that kind of yeah. stuff and so just how he goes through and like talks about the priorities of that just you know you do have a career but you also have family and making sure they know where priorities lie and stuff like that and his family always came above his career yeah and we we get to uh interview a lot of super achievers on the show so it's always mm -hmm. cool to uh see that you know what they've not only got their stuff together on a career level because obviously you know michael w smith's top of the top mm -hmm. But um, he, he was really good about keeping accountability in place as well. Right. Yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely another part of it that I really liked because it's not only like when you go out and doing your thing and that kind of stuff, still keeping um, a good group of a team around you that makes sure you're still doing what you're supposed to be doing, um, whether it's heart-wise, faith-wise, uh, even mind wise, you know what I mean? Like making sure it's like even having them help him keep accountable to making sure he makes it home every two weeks or, you know, being a servant on the road and things like that. Yeah. And another another really cool thing that I think you mentioned was this this idea about, you know, talking to the younger you. What, what did you mean by that? Yeah, um, there's there's this cool part where uh, it's the give the advice to the younger you part. And it really stood out to me when he said it. Um, he's like, if I could tell the younger me, I would say it's not about you. Hmm. And what he means by that is like just earlier on realizing, you know, like, yeah, you're given these gifts and stuff like that. But it's like realistically, the gifts help other people like it's being a servant, making sure, you know, you're using the gifts for the right reason. Like everybody wants to be successful, but it's like how you want to be successful, you know, dictates a different way and the way you look at it and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And that's his thing. Like earlier on, he looked at it a little bit differently. Like, you know, how many CDs does he sell? Like how, how good was the merch and that kind of stuff. And he realized pretty early yeah. on after that, he's like, it's, it's not about that. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. You know, is he reaching the lives? Is he reaching other people? And I think that goes across anything we do. Like, you know, the stuff we work on, you know, it's like, even we don't go out there and tour with it, but yeah. it's like, you know, still, 
putting in the hundred percent, you know, because at the end of the day, it's not about me. That's right. It's about that. Yeah, it's good. Well, here is a clip from our full circle music show episode with Michael W. Smith. Thinking back over all the years being an artist, I think one of the things that I struggle with and a lot of young artists or writers or producers struggle with is the whole balance of being a creative versus, you know, being a, being a good family man. How have you found balance over the years to kind of keep all of that together? And, you know, what's the secret for that? Well, we made the, one. we made the rule, Devin, I'm, you know, when, when this thing started really taking off, you know, when the Amy thing, and then I'll, I just did the friends tour and big picture tour, we started having children. So you were married when it was, I got well, I got married in eighty one. Okay. To Deb, so it'll be thirty five years this year. So. Congratulations! Thank you. That's amazing. She's awesome. Yeah. And but we knew, I think we probably really knew probably when I did the Lead Me On tour, which was probably most most successful, other than the Change the World tour. It was probably the most successful tour I've ever been a part of because we yeah. sold out arenas. Me yeah. and Amy all around the country yeah. and in other countries as well. Yeah. And we just started seeing people in our genre and then other genres when it came to being entertainers and all that sort of thing that marriages were falling apart left and right. And so we we kind of, I remember just having a talk with Deb and just going, you know, there's probably more if we don't make some rules, we're, there's probably more chances of us being a casualty than not. And yeah. we're not going to be a casualty. Yeah. And so I just we just made the rule I'm not going to ever be gone more than two weeks from my family ever. Wow. Wow. Even if I had to cross the pond and come back and cross it again. Yeah. And I was never gone from Deb and the kids for more than two weeks. Wow. I had a little aircraft and I don't talk about that much, you know. Yeah. I just worth every it was worth every penny. I thought I've got to get home to my family. Yeah. And a lot of times I'd I'd do a show and I'd literally walk off stage and got in a car and I was on the jet and I was home at midnight and I'm driving carpool at seven fifteen. Wow. I did that for 12 and a half years. Yeah. And um, and I think if you talk to my kids, I think, I mean, I think if you could have a private one-on-one, -on -one, I think they would all say we were more important to my dad than his career was. Wow. So you just, and now I got all these young bands. I got some of these young kids are all starting to come to me and ask me exactly what you asked me. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's part of my role in the future is sort of be a fatherly role and try to help kids you know and yeah i just don't think you can do 250 shows on the road and keep a family together i just yeah. and they said well we got to pay the bills we got to make the house payment my response is then buy a smaller house wow is there anything that you would kind of say to the younger you when you were first getting into it that you're like okay you might want to do that a little differently is there is there anything that kind of comes to mind like that well i, I think heart wise i, I mean Obviously, we all, we all grow up. We all make mistakes. I think we all get, if we really are seeking the Lord, we all get a little wiser as we get older. But yeah. I'd probably go back and tell myself at 23, 24 years old, I'd probably just say, dude, it's not about you. That's probably the first thing I would say. Yeah. You know? And I was so like, you know, how many records did we sell? Did we sell any T-shirts? And you're just so like, and it's hard because you're excited. You want to be successful, you know, and. I think I would just wish I'd have seen the bigger picture a little bit. And that's probably what I'd say to these young kids going, why are you here? Sure. Reconnect with why you're here because you're, you're not here to be a superstar. Yeah. You know, but there's nothing wrong with being successful at all, you know, but it just, it can't drive you. It can't just encompass everything that you do. It just can't, you know? So yeah. I always say, what's your contribution? Think about, you know, and even in the hard times and trying to get the thing off the ground, are you making a contribution? Are you changing somebody's life? Yeah. You know? So yeah. it's that kind of stuff I'd probably say. And then if I had to say something on the musical level, I'd say it all starts with the song. X O'Connor sitting here with Mr. Seth Mosley, founder of Full Circle Music, mm -hmm. getting ready to talk a little podcast action. Yeah. So your favorite episode out of the, we're at episode 100 now. Crazy. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. And your favorite one was with Chris Hauser. Yeah. Under very interesting circumstances, from what I remember, kind of spontane, uh, spontaneous. Spontaneous. It, it was very spontane. Yeah. I, I like that slang. You know, it's uh, it's kind of like Prefontaine, that runner guy, but it's spontane. Yeah. It, it kind was, of flows it, off the tongue. This was a spontane <laughs> moment. We were in the car, actually, on a uh, radio tour. And one thing that I've learned by doing a podcast is we're really you know, as sort of journalists, like trying to bring interesting stories to our audience, 
about stuff that they'll actually care about, you kind of just have to be ready at all times. So yeah. I, I've got this little, you know, pocket recorder and yeah. a, a couple of microphones. I stuck it in the bag because I felt like we might have some interesting conversations on this Matt Hammett radio promo tour. Yep. Yeah. I, w- I went out with him at the beginning of the year um, to promote his first single, Tears, off his record. Yeah. And so I just brought it with me, and we we're spending a lot of time in the car. So I was like, okay, there's going to be something good. So it was under interesting circumstances. But I think what, I, what I've loved about our podcast is when our guests kind of just go off the rails a little bit and just feel free to, like, tell stories and just crazy. And Chris is such a great storyteller. Yeah. So... It was one of my favorite episodes, and not only because of the episode itself, but really because of my story and how I um, met Chris in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that he did that stuck out to me that I'll never forget, um, we touch on that in the podcast as well. I love it. And he's known for hitting as many radio stations as humanly possible in a very brief time. I believe you said he has a record. Yeah. Do you he, remember what the record is? He does have a record. He said he hit 13 stations in three days. <laughs> did so, you? What, now, were you a part of that 13 stations in three days? I think we did maybe, we might have done eight in two days. Eight so, in two days. That's still rather impressive. It was It was a decent few. and um, But I just, I love it because, uh, you know, so often in this business, we think about the result more than the yep. relationship. And one thing that he drove home that you'll you'll hear in this clip, is that he talks about really what he does for a living is to get to go talk to his friends yeah. about music that he loves. Yeah, He actually cares about the people. Yep. And there are very few people that I know in life, let alone in music and in anything, that have spent three decades serving one group of people. Yep. And that's just dedication. Man, you said it right there. It's yeah. powerful. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready to go back and listen to the episode myself. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> so let's jump into this episode with Chris Hauser. But you talked about you started tapping into your skill set, which I don't even know if you remember this, but when I first moved to Nashville, I talk a lot about this on our podcast that my first record that I got was Newsboys Take Me to Your Leader. Then my first label record I produced was this one called Newsboys Born Again, which you were working on. Yes. And I think I met you once maybe at Wes's house. Then I saw you like I don't know, a month later or something, and you were like, hey, Seth, it's good to see you. And the fact that you even just remembered my name oh, wow. was huge. To me, your competitive advantage is you actually care about people, uh, and I think, you're great with relationships. Thank you, man. So, uh, that, means, that means a lot. And again, it's a this is a small industry we're in, and I'm in my 30th year of promotion. Wow. Radio promotion. And I think I'm starting to get it figured out, but every once in a while something comes along and surprises me. But I've seen a lot of people come in and go out from this industry. And one of my favorite clients, Brash Music, who had Aaron Schust and and Gunger, their MO was life's too short to work with jerks. Mm, And I also believe very strongly that you reap what you sow and whatever you sow, you reap way more and you reap way later. Yeah. It's just the way it is. You yeah. can go out to a field with a handful of seeds and throw it out into the field. You don't go out the next day and say, oh my gosh, look at all the growth. It takes a long time, but all the growth that comes into a field from one handful of seeds. And so I've always tried to be about sowing good seed, doing my best to love people well and not losing myself in the process, which at times has been a challenge for me. Yeah, dude, I, I don't remember <laughs> meeting you and I wish I did, but it's been an amazing thing to watch your trajectory as well. And to be doing this, we're on a promo tour yeah, right now. This, that's the fun thing right now. We're out with a uh, artist named Matt Hammett. Yeah, yeah, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> we're actually promoting his new single, Tears. So this is what you do all the time, right? Yes. So these radio stations, we're visiting six, seven radio stations in two days. My record is 13 stations in three days. Wow. Uh, that was up in the Midwest. That involved taking a high-speed ferry across Lake Michigan <laughs> from Muskegon, <laughs> Michigan, over to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Amazing. Dropping off one rental car picking up another rental car and continuing to go. But 
These radio stations have a hard job. They've got 50 to 75 singles getting work to them yeah. every week by 30 to 35 record promoters, both between labels and indies. Sure. And so one of the ways that we get noticed is by bringing artists directly to them. And Matt is so beloved for, you know, radio stations are going to play Lead Me Right. Every day until Jesus comes back. <laughs> it's just a matter of fact. No yep. one's going to get tired of Lead Me yep. by Sanctus Real. And so I never worked a Sanctus Real record. I've watched them from afar and been so impressed with them and their ministry. And so, you know, there are other people you could go to, but you came to me to take this record to radio. I'm very honored by it. But in addition, I'm moved by it. I have to love, this is what I tell people. I make a great living talking to my friends all day long about music I love. It's a pretty good job. So I turn down the records I don't love. I take the records that move me and the records that I love by artists that I respect. And I'm calling my friends. I'm not calling adversaries. I'm not talking to people at radio that I have to buffalo or steamroll or belittle or slam a phone down and swear and call them jerks behind their backs. I love these people. These are my friends. So I get to just go bring Matt and you, Seth, to my friends for the next two days. And these are people who work hard, like me, back in the day, they do it way better than me, but none of them are making, you know, major amounts of money. They're doing this for love and calling, and yet they're the venue, they're the avenue that we will go through to get this song on the air. And it's already impacting countless thousands of people around the country in a very, very short amount of time. Yeah, well, even on the, it's on Sirius Highway, or Sirius XM The Message, they debuted the lyric video and we were just looking on the way up here and it's already at 37,000 views and 893 shares, which is a pretty substantial metric for yes. a brand new label, essentially relaunching an artist. Yes. So that's a huge thing. Yes. Are you ever surprised and shocked with like a song that you think is gonna work, doesn't work, or a song that you don't think is gonna work, just blows up? Yes. I would say my joke on that is through years of therapy, I've been able to mellow out a little bit, <laughs> but there were times 10 and 15 years ago that I was sure a song was gonna be a smash and nobody wanted it. It's like these 115 radio PDs got together in a smoky room somewhere <laughs> and all decided what they were going to tell us promoters for the next year. And then they'd all go like break and they'd clap hands and they'd walk out and so, when I would get this massive pushback on a song, in the early days of this kind of promotion, I would go like, I don't know what a hit is anymore. I've lost it. And then I would go to the next step. I'm like, am I even a Christian? I mean, you know, and then I'd go all the way to like, God, are you even there? I mean, if I can't. <laughs> and so again, years of therapy yeah. have helped mellow me out and life experience just to get into a better spot of going, you know what? Sometimes I'm wrong, a lot of times I'm right, and sometimes it's the radio stations that will say, oh no, that's not a hit. I try to slow the no. Yeah. I try to yeah. slow them down because it's like, if you make a pronouncement, a negative pronouncement on a song this early, it's gonna be that much harder for you to admit you're wrong sure. eight months down the line, six months down the line. Let's just calm down. You tell me no now, it's fine. I'm just gonna go find 20 people that you respect <laughs> and get them to play the song. And we'll come back around. We'll just keep talking about it. And those people they respect, is that other radio promoters? No, no, other radio stations. Radio stations. Other radio stations. Yeah. So then they're watching around to see who else, because it's all defensive posturing and maneuvering. It's all, they don't wanna add a record. A radio station will say, we'll never be hurt by a record we don't play. Do you get that? Wow. We can never be hurt by a record we don't play, meaning we might be hurt if we go too early on a song that our listeners end up not liking. Sure. So we'd rather watch the landscape and see what people are playing out here. And I was like, okay, that's fine. There are leaders, there are followers. If you need to be a follower on this, no harm, no foul. We're just going to keep working this. 
So I'm sitting here with Logan Crockett, VP of Marketing for Full Circle Music, and man, what a ride it's been. We're on mm -hmm. episode 100 on the Full Circle Music show, and we're talking about our favorites, favorite moments, and why listeners should probably go back and listen to some of them. And I love, yeah. I love that you picked the Tony Wood episode. So what uh, stood out to you about that, and why should people go back and listen? Yeah, for sure. Um, so with me, my perspective on the podcast is probably a little bit different from a lot of the rest of the staff. Uh, I've been around uh, for just over a year now, um, actually working for Full Circle. But initially listening to this podcast, I was completely from the outside looking in. I was just um, kind of like a, a lot of the people probably listening or, and or watching this. Someone just uh, trying to kind of find their their lane, their path in the music industry, and the this episode with Tony Wood and this clip that we're about to play just really stuck out with to me as something that I've never ever forgotten for so long. I mean, I've been pursuing the music industry for years, and it had always felt like, man, if you can just get kind of that one meeting with that publisher or that record label or, or whatever company or just meet that right person and get that connection if you can just do that that's kind of you know hopefully the gateway to, to greater things that kind of getting that meeting basically but in this clip um tony tony explained that it, it was so much more about getting meeting number two than about getting meeting number one because it, it really does make sense. Getting meeting number two means that if you had meeting number one, they have to like you enough to invite you back. And and the way that Tony explained it in this clip, it was just it was such a massive mindset shift for me because it just it reformed my entire strategy for what I was trying to do with the music industry. It became so much more about, okay, yes, meeting one obviously has to happen, but actually that's the easy part. So my goal was how how do I get meeting number two? Meeting number one um, kind of flew out the window, and everything became about how do I score meeting number two, no matter what relationship I'm building, no matter what opportunity I'm pursuing, the goal became meeting number two. Yeah, and in music, it's, it's often about finding someone who is really where you want to be mm -hmm. and kind of emulating them. Um, wasn't there something that stood out in the episode about that in particular? Yeah, he Tony uh, had kind of got his start um, thanks to someone named Tom Long, who, who was kind of that first person who really believed in him and helped introduce him to other people. And that was another uh, big mindset thing for me too, was this idea that um, you know, there's there's a lot in the music industry that you can control. There, there's a lot of things that you can do yourself to push yourself forward. But it's going to be really, really, really difficult to get where you ultimately want to be if you're not finding someone else who can kind of elevate you. If you'd kind of, can't, you need to find a, a champion or a guide, someone who can um, get you further along the steps that you need to go. I love it. And uh, there's also this concept of do your homework that Tony hints on. What what did what did you mean by that? Because you were you were saying that that stood out to you. Yeah. Um, See, so yeah, again, all this stuff is in the clip that we're about to play. But Tony, it, it's a very kind of quick comment that Tony mentions. But when he was first meeting uh, these other writers around town and, and other publishers, uh, he said that he did his homework on on who they were uh, and what they were up to. So basically, I that really stood out to me because now working for Full Circle, you know, we have a lot of people who come you know, through a lot of our events and things like that. But it feels like a lot of them haven't done their homework. A lot of them, you know, don't know the, um, like even, you know, who's, who is full circle and like, what are the, are the different things that we do? What songs have we been working on? Things like that. Like normally, like I, I'm on a lot of calls with people through our academy and things like that. Normally, like I have to completely explain almost from ground zero, like what it is that we do, who we are, things like that. Not the case for everyone. But all that to say is if, if you are pursu pursuing the music industry before, I, and this kind of goes back into meeting one versus meeting two, before you get meeting one, make sure you do your homework so that way you're, you're giving your best first impression and you're having amazing talking points when you do finally have the opportunity to sit down and have those interactions. That's good. One, one thing that I love that we get to do with the academy, with our events, with courses and um, all of this stuff that we're doing is that we're... We're, we're, we're helping dreamers, essentially. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of this um, common thread that we've heard, and I think 
you mentioned that Tony hints on this in the podcast and, um, but, but this concept of just trying, just giving it a try. Yeah. And, and why is that important? Do you think? Um, towards the end of the clip that we're about to play, uh, Tony mentioned kind of his ultimate motivation towards the, the big jump toward to moving to Nashville and, and pursuing all these opportunities. And his whole thing was like, you know, there's so many, there's so many great opportunities in life. You know, to, you don't have to be in the music industry. Not everyone is meant to be in the music industry. Um, the music industry is very competitive. Not everyone who wants to be in it is going to be in it. Uh, but but Tony's whole point was. Um, that, that just really resonated with me was this idea of, man, like if I don't just try and kind of give it everything that I have, a no is okay. Like, like if I meet the right people and if I, I'm, you know, perfecting my craft and it's not good enough to be where it needs to be for the industry, then at least I tried and I can live with that. Mm. But he, but his big thing was like, man, like if I don't try and give it all that I have, I won't be able to live with that. And that just resonated so much with me at the time. Cause, cause again, this was like, I think early 2016. Um, so again, me for, at the time, my involvement in the music industry was a little limited. I'd recently gotten out of college with my music business degree, but um, I, I had a really great marketing job, but I wasn't that involved in the music industry. I was like running sound with my church and some things like that. But I, I knew that, you know, like just in my being, like I'm like the music industry is where I ultimately want to be. Um, but and I was in a place where I kind of had a good job and all that sort of thing. But it was like, man, can I live with it if I don't do all that I can to to get myself down to Nashville to mm -hmm. pursue these opportunities? And and Tony just saying that it's like, it was like he was speaking for me in that moment. It's like yes, like that is ultimately where I'm at. And I I, I decided like you know that there is no way that I, I will be able to live with it if I don't try yeah. and give it all that I have, no matter what the outcome is. So. Yeah. And here you are. Indeed. So, fruit, <laughs> fruit of the podcast. That's awesome. Well, here is a clip from Tony Wood interview on the Full Circle Music Show. ASCAP was real helpful to me early, early as a songwriter. There was a conference that they offered like about five or six Monday nights in a row in October where they brought in writers, producers, publishers, some great instruction, something in that that was so significant. Songwriter Dwight Lyle said, the hardest meeting to get in Nashville with a publisher is not the first meeting. The hardest meeting to get is the second meeting. Hmm. And wow. it just killed me in that moment because I am such an introvert. I am, you know, and they would talk, use the word networking. And I hate the word because <laughs> networking feels like walk across this room and introduce yourself to this stranger and tell them why they need to get to know you. And it's like, it's against everything within me. I'd rather just take a meeting yeah. than, than, than do that. And I was like, oh, Oh no! If the hardest meeting to get is the second one, I, I better be ready when I get that. When I finally get the nerve up to go introduce myself, I've got to know that I'm that I'm ready. Um, so you know that sends me into a month or so of panic about what do I do? What do I do? And I came up with this idea. Tom Long was the head of membership at ASCAP at that time, and he had put the conference on. The conference had happened three or four months earlier, and I'd been stewing on that. And so, you know, here was the first professional initiation for me. I picked up the phone and I called Tom. I said, Tom, in the course that, that you moderated, somebody said the hardest meeting to get with a publisher is not the first, the hardest is the second. I need to be ready. I need somebody to tell me if I'm ready. Mm. And here comes the ask, Tom, will you be that man for me? Wow. And Tom says, well, nobody's kind of ever asked me that, but okay, I'll tell you what, every couple of months, give me a call, bring me some of the lyrics that you're writing, and I'll take a look at them and tell you. Mm. You know, I can't tell my story without such gratitude to Tom, yeah. Tom Long for that. But that was, so I take the first meeting with, with Tom Long, walk in the three current pieces of paper that I've, that I've typed up, put them on his desk, sit there, you know, quietly feeling my organs separating while he's, while he's yeah. reading in the moment, just the <laughs> tension, just dying right there. Yeah. And Tom reads three and says, I've got some people you need to meet. Get wow. in the car. Drove me around to four publishers. I'd done my homework. I knew 
who the publishers were. I knew these people. I knew who their writers were. I knew the songs that they were having success with at that point. The first three dismissed me pretty quickly. And go, eh, no, thanks, but no thanks. And the fourth one was Michael Purrier, who was with a small company, Lorenz Creative Services, that was going at the time. They had just... They had, just signed Stephen Curtis, though before his first wow. record, that was his first home. And, and um, they had recently signed Marcus Hellman, who wrote God Bless the Broken right. Road. And yeah. so it was kind of this small little boutique thing that was going on. And Michael is more of a, a lyric guy. And, and he said, oh, why don't you start hanging around here some and let me see if I can get some of our guys to write with you. And that, and that was, you know, the life-changing moment for me. I'm yeah. so grateful to Michael for early belief in me. Sure. So backing up, because the, just the move to Nashville is such a huge leap of faith in, in the moment. I don't want to gloss over that for you and your wife. I'm sure that was just like a, a monumental thing. How does somebody know when they're ready to do that? <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> there is no knowing. There is nobody that's going to say the time is right. You, you, you need to. I mean, it's that it is that line between faith and foolishness that's mm. so close in there. You you don't know. But I remember th- there was a point when, when I was finishing up school and still writing, you know, frantically accumulating lots of sheets of paper. And they were in a box kind of under under a bed, early 20s. And I remember thinking, I can't imagine hitting 50 and not knowing, not trying. Hmm. I could, I could live if I dared to show those to somebody and they said, oh, thanks, but no, there's really not a place for you. Yeah. But I couldn't live with myself if I didn't at least try. I remember sometimes feeling almost claustrophobic at that thought, like if I hit 50 and I've never at least tried, I almost, I almost couldn't breathe yeah. thinking about that. So that was, that was some of the motivation that, you know, if they had said, no, thanks, go, go away. I could have lived with that. I could have gone and gotten, I could have worked at a church and been real happy with, with that, knowing that I tried, but not trying just was killing. Hey everyone, this is X O'Connor and you've been listening to the full circle music show, the why of the music biz. Hope everyone enjoyed our episode 100, the special episode. It's impossible to believe that it's been 100 episodes already and again this is our last episode for a little bit we're going to be coming back at you with our brand new reimagined rebranded podcast the made it in music podcast it's going to be starting monday march 26th it's so exciting we're so pumped so again remember march 26th that's a monday that's going to be the official beginning of the made it in music podcast and we have some huge names already lined up for this you guys are going to be super excited about what we've got to come it's going to be more great content for free for you we're looking forward to seeing you monday march 26th